The question of why evil is allowed to exist has been perhaps the hardest problem for Christians throughout the ages. And, admittedly, we don't have a perfect unified answer. But this is what the reform tradition has to say about it. Sup guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. And today I'm going to be talking about evil. Quite an easy topic to talk about, isn't it? But I'm making this video today when the decision from the Supreme Court has come out that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. So we have not experienced very many victories in the culture, but this is one of them. So I'm going to pretend that um, this is a... That this is the spirit of, of pro-choiceness, because I, I don't endorse violence, but um, I'm fighting against pro-choiceness as an abstract concept. No, I'm not encouraging violence against anyone, so in case someone was going to report this video, that's not what I was doing right there. But anyway, so yes, uh, it's a good um, way to transition to talking about evil, because everyone's talking about abortion today on my social media. A bunch of, you know, feminists that I went to high school with are really depressed that they won't be able to kill their babies if they get pregnant at some college party. So, um, yeah, it's... Why, why does God even allow this stuff in the first place? Why does God allow evil and suffering? And there's, and there's tons of it in the world, no one can deny that. So yeah, admittedly, this is something that the church has actually struggled with. The church has unified answers on many things. Why does humanity exist? We exist to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Um, what is the only way to be saved? Through the um, work of Jesus Christ. Uh, those are questions that the church has always had a unified answer to. When I say the church, I mean like the historic church. Of course, you'll find like weird fringe groups that will say all sorts of things. But the problem of evil, or the fancy theology philosophy term for that is theodicy, I'm just going to call it the problem of evil, um, has always troubled Christians. Because, you know, if God is all-powerful, meaning he can do anything, and he is all-good, meaning he is does not will evil, then why is there evil? So there have generally been two main approaches to this. Now, I generally don't like dividing, like... Christianity into Calvinist and Arminian, because that's a false dichotomy, and there's so many other alternatives to those two. Usually, Arminian is a term used by Calvinists to describe anyone who's not Calvinist, basically, so it's like, okay, you're either Calvinist or you're an Arminian, or maybe you can be like, uh, two-point Calvinist, three-point Arminian, or, or something like that. But, um, in this video, this is one of the examples where that dichotomy almost does work to an extent. So, the two, there have been two big explanations for the problem of evil in church history. And one is more Calvinistic in nature, even though it's not just Calvinists who have used it. And one sounds more Arminian in nature. So, the one that sounds more Arminian, you could say is, of course, the free will answer. So most Christian apologists will use this. Like, why is there, why is there evil? Oh, it's because um, we, God wants us all to have free will. Free will to choose the good or the evil, and we can't do that if there's no evil to potentially choose. So, um, that's, I think, probably an easier explanation to use against uh, an atheist who's challenging Christianity. But just theologically, I don't think that's accurate. And, of course, you could... There are still problems with it. Because you could say, like, Oh, um, why does God need us to have free will? And the, the biggest problem with that, from a Christian perspective, is if free will is this some end-all, be-all thing that we must have, like, in the new heavens and the new earth, once everything is redeemed, are we going to have the same type of free will then? And if that's the case, is it possible for, like, um, another Adam and Eve to, like, start the whole thing all over again, to start sin all over again? So, yeah, that's why free will doesn't really work as an explanation for why evil exists. Because we know God's going to destroy evil, and there's going to be, you know, a redeemed creation. And when we live there, is are we going to have free will there? So, yeah, that's why free will doesn't really work as an explanation. So the more reformed Calvinist answer, um, I'm not sure what St. Augustine said. Like, St. Augustine is the guy, um, one of the uh, church fathers who a lot of Calvinism is based on. I need to study Augustine more. Um, 
if I'm going to guess, I would assume he'd take this position, but this is um, explicitly the position of reformed people. But I, I don't want to say this is the Calvinist answer, because you could agree with this even if you're not part of a reformed or Calvinist tradition. And it's this, that um, basically God allows evil because he is glorified in triumphing over it. So I'm going to use an, an analogy of music to explain this. Right now I'm going to play um, a chord, right? Now in music terms, because I'm a classical musician, I've studied uh, music theory, in music terms we would call that chord consonant because it sounds good and right to our ears. Now here's another chord to uh, compare it to. Right, so relative to that, that sounds... Um, that sounds dissonant. Dissonance is a chord that does not sound good to our ears because things do not seem to line up or be in the right order. Um, as a musician, I've learned that um, the uh, structures of musical chords and harmony are not just arbitrary human inventions, they're actually built into nature. The major chord is based on mathematics. So which chords sound good and which don't are built into nature. That's one of the many ways we can know that God has not just created our universe, but created it beautifully. Um, but this is also um, a good analogy for the, the meaning and purpose of evil. So now I'm going to play a dissonant chord followed by a consonant chord. So in music, this is called, like, the resolution of a dissonance. A dissonance that resolves to a consonant, a bad, not a bad sounding, sort of like tension and release, a chord that doesn't sound good to our ears, resolving to a chord that does sound good to our ears, that is even better than just a pure, um, pure uh, consonant chords all the time. So this is a big musical concept in almost any piece of classical music you listen to. Actually, no, literally any piece of classical music you listen to. There will be some of this tension and release. So composers of music will actually employ these um, dissonant, uncomfortable sounding chords because it creates a better um, effect, a better sound overall when the uncomfortable dissonant chord resolves to a pretty consonant chord. And I think that is a good analogy for why God allows evil. Of course God could destroy all evil because eventually he's going to. But for now, we're in the stage of dissonance, of this uncomfortable tension. This the, the chord has not been resolved yet, so to speak, but once it does, it will have been better than if there had never been any dissonance at all. So... Um, like, that is sort of the big picture explanation for why evil exists. A more, like, small picture explanation is, oh, because there's sin. And that, that is, that is a true explanation. Sin, like, the wages of sin is death. So if you're asking, why does God let bad stuff happen to good people? The answer is, that only happened once to Jesus, and he volunteered. I think that's a quote from R.C. Sproul, or, 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 or one of those guys like him. But, yeah, so... The simple answer to why is there evil is just because of sin. But then you could trace that back even further and say, okay, why did God allow sin to happen? It's like, oh, because of Satan. Why did God allow Satan to fall? Um, why did God allow that? So you could always trace it back to when you get to the um, first origin of evil. So the best explanation we can give is, like I said, because God is glorified in triumphing over evil. Because God is our victor. Um, Christ triumphed over death on the cross. So, um, like, the glory that God gets from uh, destroying evil is worth it. Because in Reformed thinking, and not all Christian traditions tend to think this way, but re the Reformed tradition is unique for thinking this way, um, God's glory is valued above all else. Like, um, if you've heard of the five solas, um, sola gratia, meaning grace alone, sola fide, meaning faith alone, solus Christus, Christ alone, sola scriptura, scripture alone, and soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. Sola just means alone. And all historic Protestants um, believe those. But 
different um, different branches of the Protestant Reformation have stressed and emphasized different ones of those. So the Lutheran tradition largely emphasizes the second one, sola fide, because um, Lutheranism is largely centered around like our own assurance of salvation and um, really stressing the, the grace of God and salvation by faith alone, that sort of stuff. And I have the utmost respect for the Luther, Lutheran tradition, by the way, but at the same time, it's not my tradition. The Reformed tradition, um, we, we also do believe salvation is by faith alone and that it's important to provide people with assurance of salvation, but we do see everything in the light of God's glory. That is the sola that we stress most, soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. Of course, Lutherans also care about that sola, like Johann Sebastian Bach, who is the most biggest genius of all time, not just in terms of music, but in terms of everything. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach would write soli deo gloria at the bottom of all of his compositions. I always say that Bach is the, the greatest argument for Lutheranism, and he is. He was an extremely devout Lutheran and even worked... Uh, Lutheran theology into uh, many of the pieces that he wrote. So yeah, um, I must admit there have not been very many good Calvinist composers, because one thing I really don't like about um, what the original reformers like uh, John Calvin did is sort of cracking down on musical instrument, like banning musical instruments, banning sort of beautiful worship. And historical context explains why they did that, because they were reacting against um, Rome, which would, like, neglect the needs of the people in the church just to, like, show off with fancy music that wasn't even necessarily glorifying to God, because no, nobody could understand the lyrics, because they were in, like, Latin or whatever. So, yeah, you can understand why they did that, but um, I, I still don't agree with that. Um, that, that. That's, I think, the biggest flaw of the early reformers. Anyway, I got sidetracked. I was talking about, um, I was talking about, like, Soli Deo Gloria. We see everything through the lens of God's glory, and God's glory is what matters most in Reformed thinking. Um, and it does matter in other traditions, but not as much as it does in, re in Reformed, uh, Reformed theology. So because of that, we say it is logical to say that God allows evil for his own glory, because that's what matters most because he is glorified in defeating it. God is not the source of evil, because um, God is the source of the good. The definition of good is that which is rooted in God's nature. So God cannot create evil. So that means the true source of evil is kind of a mystery. Um, I'm acting like a Lutheran here, appealing to mystery. Uh, now, what we would say is that evil does not have substance the way good has substance, because evil is a lack of good. It's the same way that cold is not a thing. Cold is just a lack of heat. Heat is a thing, but cold is not. It's just a, a deprivation of heat. Or like darkness. There's no essence of darkness. Darkness is just the absence of light. So likewise, evil is just the absence of good. Um, and that's why it is possible to have uh, good with no evil, but in a universe where um, good doesn't exist, then evil wouldn't really exist either. I mean, I, I, it's not logically possible to have a universe where good doesn't exist because existence is also rooted in God's nature. That's why I say it's logically impossible for God to not exist because the definition of God is the I am, is the source of all existence. But that's like the ontological argument uh, is that's a topic for another day. I, I often get sidetracked, and when you're talking about theology, you can really easily get sidetracked because all theological issues are connected to one another. That's why, um, and uh, here I am getting sidetracked again, that's why I think um, when people say, oh, I'm not really committed to any one denomination, I'm like, I think when you grow in your Christian faith enough, you should be committed to one denomination. I sort of rather someone is committed to a Christian tradition other than my own, than just sort of floating around, because all theological issues impact one another. What you believe about one thing will affect what you believe about another thing. So these theological traditions are really sets of beliefs that are consistent within themselves. Uh, so 
Reformed Calvinist tradition is a system of beliefs that's consistent with itself. Same with the Lutheran tradition. Same with the sort of Wesleyan Methodist tradition. Same with the Eastern Orthodox tradition. So, um, I th that's why I think, um, yeah, like, that's also why um, I don't like when people define Calvinism as simply a belief in the five points of Calvinism, which Calvin actually had nothing to do with. They're based on his teachings loosely, and I would agree with them, but I don't like when people reduce Calvinism to just that. Because then you have all these, you know, Baptist non-denominational churches that call themselves Reformed or Calvinist just because they agree with the five points of Calvinism, despite not being rooted in the Reformed tradition at all. And, um, yeah, I don't... With some rare exceptions, I don't consider Reformed Baptists to be Reformed because infant baptism is a, is a fundamental belief to how um, Reformed Christians see the, the covenant. Now, I'm not saying... Um, Reformed Baptists or Baptists in general, I don't think like I have anything against them. It's just that they're a separate thing. They're a separate tradition from the Reformed tradition. Um, it's 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 nothing personal. It's just I don't really I don't happen to think Reformed Baptists are actually Reformed. Um, that being said, a lot of um, Presbyterians in in name are not really Reformed because you know who am I to talk? My my denomination is the PCUSA, and if you know what that is, then you know enough said. So it's not like Presbyterians are always perfect on that either. But okay, anyway, I, I yeah I, I got sidetracked again. So yeah, the the Calvinist answer for why God allows evil is for His own glory. And um, even though I'm normally a pretty big critic of John MacArthur, um, I think more of his teachings are unhelpful than helpful. He does have a pretty good sermon on why God allows evil and suffering. And that actually, like, I feel like every, you know, Calvinist, even those who are part of a Presbyterian church like me, go through a phase where they listen to a lot of Reformed Baptist people, like John MacArthur or Steve Lawson or James White or, and, or people like R.C. Sproul who are technically Presbyterian but hang out with Baptists and you can see how it influences their teachings. But some of John MacArthur's lectures actually did help me in my um, process of becoming Reformed and understanding Reformed theology. So I would say John MacArthur has a sliver of true Reformed Christianity, and most of it is just, you know, Baptist fundamentalism. Um, but there, I will, I, I do give credit where credit is due. I still, John MacArthur still has some very good quotable phrases, and I, I still will use them, even though, overall, I'm not a John MacArthur fan, in, in case that is not... I don't think any, like, Presbyterians or really, really are that much. It's, um... He's mostly popular among Reformed Baptists. Anyway, but I would agree with him on why, why God allows evil. He has this pretty big talk... And it's basically what I said. God allows evil for his own glory. And that is that is the Reformed answer. So, yeah, that sort of... What I like what he said in that lecture is we shouldn't try to get God off the hook. Um, because the many of the other explanations, like free will or a sort of yin-yang view of good and bad, their effort... They, they're trying to get God off the hook for evil when God in the Bible does take responsibility for making some evil things happen even though he does not create evil itself he sort of shapes it and molds it into the ways he wants so that he can overcome it with good so yes um we know that evil exists and we can't provide a flawless 100 percent perfect explanation as to why but we know that god will and in some sense already has defeated all evil and that is good news